Hello everybody, how's it going? So today we start our very first videos in, a, in our archive library on the YouTube channel and uh, my name is Yumna and I have Yusuf with me. Hey Yusuf, how are you doing? Hello, how's it going? <laughs> yeah, I'm glad to have you man. Uh, so we're gonna start by explaining ASD, atrial septal defects. So the reason why we're different from any other videos you'll find on the YouTube is that we try to explain things the best we could and we will provide you with all the possible scenarios that those, this information could come up on the real deal so that you'd be learning in the most efficient way. So let's get started. Alright, so we're going to be talking about uh, atrial septal defect. We're going to start with the embryology and how the defect occurs and why it occurs. And then we'll move on to, to the physiology and the sounds you could hear on auscultation as well as the pathology and finally the clinical Im implications of ASD. Okay, so let's start. How are the atria formed? So the first step is you have the endocardial cushions at the base of the two atria over here. And then you have the septum prim that starts to grow downwards from the top over there. And as it grows downwards, the gap between it and the endocardial cushions is known as the ostium primum. And we have a better diagram. Yes, as you can see over here. And primum is Latin for first, because we'll talk about the secundum there, in the next. Oh, there's a second one. Let's go. Yep. So, um, as you could see here, the ostium secundum forms at the top part of the septum primum. Okay, so, okay, that's, now it's too much information. How could this come up on the real deal? All right, great. So, I've seen um, this question on step one QBanks multiple times, and they would ask you, through what process does the ostium secundum occur? And the answer in that case would be apoptosis. Oh, what about the ostium primum? It's not apoptosis? All oh, right, yeah, that's a good question. So the ostium primum is basically because the septum primum did not yet reach the endocardial cushion, yeah. right? So it's not like the ostium secundum where you had tissue over there and then apoptosis occurred and formed the ostium or foramen. Oh. So that, this is just it being lazy. It will obliterate once it reaches the end. Exactly, the like okay. here. And then you have the septum secundum. Oh, so, is that little guy? Yep. So from the second name, from sorry, from the name, it's the second one, um, and forms to the right of the septum primum. Why do we need two septa? It's because of the valve, because it can't be just one septum, right? Yeah, exactly. So here on the next slide, over here. As you can see, it forms a valve, and this is called the foramen a valve. So the way this works is, as you can see here, this is the right atrium, and this is the left atrium. So in the fetus, usually the right-sided um, pressures are higher than the left side, because, of course, the lungs are not uh, functioning. They're obsolete. Exactly. So there isn't much blood returning from the lungs into the left atrium. So the, so the pressures are low in the left atrium or right relative to the right atrium so the right atrium has higher pressures and the higher pressures in the right atrium push this septum primum to the right which allows blood to flow from the right atrium through the valve and into the left atrium and, and this is why we needed two septa because if it was just one septum it wouldn't have allowed the flow like that it wouldn't have formed this this dynamic where you just have a valve and it closes and open yeah, but we right. we don't have that in like what happened after birth what 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 happens after birth oh yes that's that's a very important point so after birth the lungs start to work now and you start breathing in air so the pulmonary vascular resistance decreases as the pulmonary blood flow increases and therefore there is more venous return from the pulmonary veins into the left atrium and therefore the left atrial pressures start to rise more relative to the right side so now this is higher and and then the the septum primum over here is pushed into the right atrium over there and this results in fusion of the two septa together which results in the formation of the atrial septum. And that's it? Yeah, that's, that's the final how the stage. That's form. Septum, yes, okay, exactly. Perfect. So, moving on to paradoxical emboli. So I'll give you a, uh, let me test you, okay? So I'll give you a clinical scenario where uh, a patient uh, was on a long flight and then he presented to the ER with uh, focal neurological defects. They, uh, like, uh, for example, they can't move their right arm or like, 
something is wrong. They have urinary incontinence, something like that. Who knows, okay? So, like, what happened? How is this even possible? So, yeah, there, there are obviously going to be uh, multiple differential diagnoses, but um, one important one would be a patent foramen aval. And, and this is particularly important because it's present in 25% of the human population, which means one in every four patients you meet will have a PFO. And so the way this occurs is that, as you said, if the patient is on a long flight, they have been sitting for a while and there's stasis of the blood, they could end up with a DVT in their legs. And this DVT will end up, excuse my drawing, will end up traveling all the way through the IVC and into the right atrium of the heart. You're a bored artist. <laughs> and as you can see, the, 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 uh, the embolus would go there into the right atrium and then through this atrial septal defect, um, or sorry, the PFO in this case, it would go into the uh, left atrium and then it would be pumped through the aorta and um, through, through the uh, carotid into the brain, which oh. would lead to a stroke. Oh, let me stop you here. You, you said something here. You, you, you said uh, PFO and that, you said ASD and then you corrected yourself into PFO. What's the difference? Aren't they both holes in the septum? Yes, that's uh, that's an important point, actually. Um, but the the difference, okay, so I'll discuss this in the next slide. So, so the the, ma the main difference between those two defects is that in PFO, there's just lack of fusion. So there's unfused tissue, as you could see here, unfused tissue. So uh, as you may recall from the first few slides, the two septa are supposed to fuse together after birth when they left atrial pressure increases and pushes the septum prim to fuse with the septum secundum. You're talking about the upper part of the septum secundum and the lower part of the septum prim, correct? Exactly, they're supposed to fuse together. But in a PFO, this does not occur. In an ASD, however, the problem is not with fusion. The problem is because the tissues did not form well enough. Oh, so there's a problem with the septa formation in the first place. Exactly. Okay, exactly. okay, that's a, that, and we could get tested on that, right? Yeah, 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 true. So there are two types of ASD. There is an ostium secundum and an ostium primum. Of course, the it's important to know that the ostium secundum is the most common form of ASD, but this is not the question I've seen on many question banks. The question that I've seen on multiple question banks is you'd get a patient with Down syndrome and then they'd give you the murmur, which we'll describe in the next few slides, and then they would ask you, um, where is this defect in, in embryologically speaking, where is this defect? And the answer would be, they, they'd give you many choices and one of them would be ostium primum, there would also be ostium secundum and you'd have to pick ostium primum. Oh, and this is actually a good memory hook for that is that but the Down syndrome patients, they have AV canal defect. So if we could point on the AV canal defect here, it would be down. Uh, so it gotta be like the septum primum is the one that's like uh, down. Uh, the ostium primum is the one that's down. The, the ostium secundum, excuse me, is the one that's up. Yep, that's okay. right. So I, I'll test you out, okay? Another question for you. Uh, I, I did, uh, I did, I did, uh, another question. I did uh, the, uh, measure the saturation, the oxygen saturation in the four chambers of the heart. And usually I know that the right atrium saturation is 70 to 76, correct? Yes, that's right. Okay, and the, the, the left atrium is around 96? Yeah. So I did this on a patient I've seen, and it ended up like the the right atrial oxygen saturation was around 84 or something. Why is that the case? And the right ventricular was also 84. Why is that the case? So, so this is quite intuitive, and I've seen this in many question banks as well. Um, and the reason this occurs, and the right atrial right atrial O2 saturation becomes higher than the normal venous blood is because, of course, the, the oxygenated blood from the left atrium gets shunted into the right atrium. And so, of course, the le right atrium and everything after that would have a higher O2 saturation, and therefore the right ventricle and the pulmonary, pulmonary trunk, all of those would have a higher O2 um, saturation. Okay. Um, and in the case of a VSD, you could also get asked on... on uh, you'd I've get a similar scenario. I've seen that patient too. Yeah. <laughs> so the their the right atrial pressure uh, oxygen saturation was like seventy, but their right ventricle was oh god bless it was like eighty four or something. Yes, exactly. So the only explanation here is a VSD. 
Yes. You don't oxygenate them not in the right ventricles. Yeah. So, okay, so I want to ask you a question. Say, like, I have an A and Z. Uh, like, hopefully not, but, like, would I be asymptomatic? Because, for example, a BFO is asymptomatic. I could have it and I'll be completely fine. But an ASD, could I be asymptomatic with it or would I die? So many patients do remain asymptomatic, but of course this depends on the size of the ASD. Mm -hmm. And this could range from uh, asymptomatic to heart failure. And of course this is because in, in, a large v in a large ASD, there would be lots of shunting from the left atrium to the right atrium. And so there's a volume overload on the right side. Also oh, we're overworking the right side of the heart. Exactly, which, which could end up with heart failure or even Eisenmenger syndrome, but this will be discussed in... in uh, that's a whole other video, a yeah. whole other topic. Yeah. Uh, thanks a lot. <laughs> okay, so, so yeah, so now let's move on. Oh, but before we move on, I wanted to move on to the auscultatory findings, but there is something. When we talked about the paradoxical impoli, we said PFO. It could also occur with an ASD, correct? Yes, that's true. It could yeah. also occur with an ASD. Okay, great. So now the auscultatory findings. I just want to say that the white fixed splitting that we hear on the S2, uh, in, in, uh, like in, in an ASD patient, it's, it's a buzzword for ASD, like once you hear that finished, yes. but we want to understand why, why is that the case? We want to explain that. So I want to ask you a question, why is it white? Why is it fixed? Alright, so bef before we start talking about the pathology and the auscultatory findings we have in ASD, uh, let's discuss the normal physiologic splitting that we have, so Fair that enough. we could understand the... Alright, so what happens... Um, the, it's important to know that the, there's always a splitting of the S2, but it becomes heard. You could actually hear it on auscultation during inspiration. Oh, All right. what happens during yeah, inspiration? Yeah, so during inspiration, when, when your chest expands and your ribcage expands because of the external intercostal muscles, this decreases the intrathoracic pressure or increases the negative pressure, which sucks up more blood into the right atrium and therefore increases the venous return. So inspiration increases the venous return, right? Mm -hmm. And this means the right ventricular filling will increase. So you'll have more blood to be pumped out of the right ventricle, which would increase the ejection time. So it would take a longer time to eject the blood out of the right ventricle and into the pulmonary artery. And therefore, the pulmonic valve will take Closes. longer to close. Closes later on. Exactly. Okay, so, but, oh yeah, please. Yeah, so, so that's why during inspiration, the P2 becomes delayed compared to the A2 and the splitting could actually be he heard on auscultation, but, unlike expiration. But I, I have like an observation here. Uh, when I look at expiration, I could see also that like the P2 is also delayed. It occurs after A2. However, the delay is way shorter. First of all, why is it delayed? Why are you doing the on expiration? Why, why, why is it delayed? And why is the delay is shorter compared with an expiration? So when you expire and the alveoli start to shrink a little bit, um, the, the blood in the lung gets squeezed out and more blood empties, more blood goes to the um, left atrium, mm -hmm. all right? And so the left, the, the increased uh, left atrial blood volume, of course, is going to empty into the uh, left ventricle. And so you'll have an increase in the left ventricular stroke volume. So again, the same concept, you're going to have more blood to eject from the left side when you expire because more blood is returning to the left atrium. And so it's going to take longer for the aortic valve to close. And so it gets very close to P2. But wait, wait a moment. Why, why is it like the B2 is always behind? Is that because the right ventricle is weaker? Yes, kind of. That's correct. Because, um, of course, as you may know, the left ventricle has more muscle mass. And so uh, it finishes pumping quicker. The blood is pumped with greater force and it travels at a higher velocity. And so A2 always closes. Uh, A2 always occurs before P2 because of that. Okay. I'm not sure we're talking about a paradoxical splitting, but that's a topic for a whole other yeah, video. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so now the fixed splitting, uh, we explained the physiology. Now we want to go to the pathology. Why is it fixed? Why is it wide? All right, so it's called wide fixed splitting. All right, so why is it wide? We're going to explain each word. First of all, why is it wide? Because because of the um, uh, chronic shunting from the left atrium to the 
right atrium because the left atrium has a higher pressure so the blood flows down the uh, pressure gradient from the left atrium to the right atrium right so the increased um, right atrial volume as, I wrote, as we wrote here uh, and the increased right ventricular volume increases the uh, blood flow across the pulmonic valve and so you have delayed pulmonic valve closure all the time during inspiration and expiration there is always more blood flowing across the pulmonic valve so the b2 poor p2 will always be behind always exactly that's why there's always going to be a wide split look at this it's always wide and the inspiration expression is irrelevant here yeah yeah that's why it's fixed yeah because during inspiration and expiration doesn't change so the reason why during expiration does they don't get closer like in the normal physiologic one is because when 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 you expire here and more blood is returning back to the left atrium by the mechanism we explained in the previous slide this blood the increased blood that comes back to the left atrium ends up getting shunted into the right atrium so it didn't make a difference oh, it's like finish so, so it won't go to the it won't go to the, the extra blood won't go to the left ventricle and then delay the closure of the aortic valve exactly so okay. again the pulmonic valve will be just as delayed as during inspiration it's not fair for the p2 <laughs> so you end up with a wide and fixed split okay so wait a moment so you explained the uh, the white fixed splitting in the perfect way but i have one more question for you the, the, is this like the white film splitting is the only oscillatory finding in an ASD? Because I've heard otherwise. Yes, that's that's true. There there is another finding that we will discuss now in the next slide. And this is also quite important. So we said there is increased pulmonary blood flow, right? That's true. So this increased pulmonary blood flow results in a um, systolic ejection murmur in the pulmonic area over here. We labeled this as number two, which is the left second intercostal space. And so that's another oscillatory finding. You'd get a wide fixed split of S2 and you'd get a pulmonic murmur because of the excess blood flow across the pulmonic valve. Systolic ejection murmur. Yes. Correct? And I remember very well on uh, my pediatric rotation, I, I didn't hear the ASD. I actually heard the yes, pulmonic that's flow murmur very exactly. well. So, so yeah, it's very... So yeah, because yeah. actually some students could, could think, oh, am I hearing the ASD over here in the pulmonic area? No, that's... Uh, sorry, the ASD. That's not the ASD's murmur. That's the excess blood flowing across the pulmonic valve, not the, the murmur of the uh, septal defect. So now, okay, lastly, we have like the, 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 the step two stuff. So we want to ask about like, how do you diagnose an ESD? All right, so the most, most definitive uh, diagnostic modality is cardiac catheterization. Okay, but that's invasive, right? Yeah, that's, that's true. And that's why um, many physicians end up uh, just performing uh, echocardiography. It's less invasive and could be just as effective. Oh, no, wait a moment. The cardiac catheterization is just like I insert with a wire and I go and I see if it goes through the septum, but that means I have a hole. Yeah, that's, that's right. That's funny. Okay, so, okay, and uh, what about the chest x-ray? Would it show something? Yeah, you could sometimes see um, a car cardiomegaly and increased vascular markings. Again, this depends on the size of the septal defect. But this is not specific to ASD. Yeah, not, definitely not a specific finding. That's why the definitive is cardiac catheterization and also echo could uh, show it most of the time. And say, God forbid, I have an ASD. What, 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 what would my doctor do? So, yeah, if you start developing uh, complications and you become symptomatic, um, the, the treatment will be um, surgery or transcatheter uh, closure, which, which is indicated for all symptoma symptomatic patients. And uh, yeah, I think... And wait, and could it, could it, could I leave it? Could it resolve on its own? Um, yeah, that's actually an important question because sometimes if the ASD is, is very small, it could self-resolve, spontaneously resolve. And I've seen a patient like that during my pediatric rotation. I remember very well, like he had an ASD and it actually resolved, so that was really cool. So it's not necessarily... Yeah, like, so it's not always bad. Okay, that's awesome. So I think that's all we have for today. And uh, like, uh, thanks a lot, Yusuf, for the great explanation. And like, if you like the video, please like, comment and subscribe. And we can't wait to join you in other videos. All right, thank you everyone for listening, and I think that concludes it.